it is a dear privilege for me to return to this pulpit. It was here in the English worship service 15 years ago, believe it or not, that I preached my first sermon as a member of the pastoral staff of FCBC Walnut. Uh, back in 2002, uh, Jackie and I came as a newlywed couple of one year. And it was here that I feel like I really became a family man, uh, learned how to be a couple in ministry. And in the course of several years here, uh, our daughter Josie was also born into this church. She was held by more uncles and aunties than we could ever count. And here we became a family in ministry. And this was also the church family that sent us into the mission field eight years ago to serve at Singapore Bible College and has supported us ever since. So thank you for being our family. We appreciate this church very much. Many of you could share similar stories of how this church is not just a church to you. It is your family. It is your home. It is precisely because this family is comfortable and welcoming that we need today to emphasize the role that FCBC Walnut plays as part of God's family and not just our own. To be a family-oriented church at a time like this when the idea of family itself is being redefined is certainly not a bad thing. In fact, it is a good thing. It is an essential thing. It is a prophetic thing. So we must do this. This church has been wise to lay down biblical guidelines for the family through revising church bylaws and also providing God's word for families to flourish under the teaching of his word. My focus this morning, though, is on the family as a means to God's end, as opposed to an end in itself. As important as it is to talk about the biblical basis of the family, even more central in God's purposes is the familial basis of his plan of salvation. To make people, his people, a part of his ever-expanding family is actually God's rescue strategy for a lost and sinful world. This is what God is doing. And we must always keep this bigger picture in mind. For when the family becomes an end in itself, a sermon series like the one that we are in now can be misunderstood as using the church as a means to our end, as if God and the church are there to help us achieve the happy family life that we want. Rather than our family serving God and becoming a prototype of the renewed humanity that he seeks to form in a fallen world. For this reason, today I have selected six texts from the Old and New Testaments, which outline the central role that the family plays in God's family of salvation. His plan, in other words, is to offer the family not as an institution that exists solely for the sake of its members, but also for the sake of his mission in the world. And likewise, the church is not a social club which exists to provide services for the sake of its members, but is a risk-taking family whose core mission is to expand its reach to include those that are not already a part of that family. That's why God has given us the family. And so our first text this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 4. And you can follow along in the outline. We will have six of these texts, which we'll touch upon briefly. In Exodus, at this point in the biblical story, Israel has been in bondage to Egypt for about 400 years. More than being just a powerful empire, Egypt is an entire way of life, where Pharaoh was a demigod in charge of everything, economics, politics, and religion. Pharaoh alone was the beloved son of the gods of Egypt. And it was his decree that the Hebrew slaves would work without end to maintain the massive state bureaucracy that Pharaoh had set up. And so in Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23, when Yahweh, the God of Israel, challenges Pharaoh and says to him, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Let my son go that he may serve me. Much more is happening here than just setting free the oppressed Hebrew slaves from this ruler. Israel is receiving an entirely new identity as God's son instead of Pharaoh's slave. 
this son will have rest. This son will have dignity. The son will have meaningful work. While being a slave in Egypt, all Israel had was fatigue, futility, and meaningless work. So being delivered from this society in which Pharaoh alone had the honored status of being a son of the Egyptian gods, all of Israel will be an honored son and enjoy the honor that God himself has. So Israel will be esteemed as family, instead of being an expendable part of Egypt's economy, instead of being an invisible cog in Pharaoh's machine. Does that sound like your job? Just being part of a machine? Something much bigger than you, but doesn't really care about you? Now, the reason for the exodus from Egypt goes far beyond receiving a new identity. That's a big part of it, but there's more. In our second text, also in Exodus, but from chapter 19, we can see that Israel, now a newborn son of about three months since Israel left Egypt, has not just been saved from oppression. Think about the way we usually consider salvation. Salvation is from something, right? But in this text, we see that salvation is not just from oppression. Salvation is also for a mission. Because in chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, the Lord says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, speaking to Israel. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel is entrusted, in verse 6, with the mission to be a whole nation of holy priests. But then this raises a question. A whole nation of priests, but priests are serving someone else. So priests for whom? For whom? Priesthood is not for their own sake. Because the Lord has already said in the verse before that, verse 5, All the earth is mine. So the answer is simply that Israel is a nation that will stand as a priestly bridge to mediate between all nations and the God who has made them. And so Israel is constituted, is organized, is brought together as a family, so that those outside that family will also have access to their God. When we imagine that salvation is merely from something, and not also for something, you know what happens? The focus then falls on the comfort we gain or the difficulty we avoid. But God never saves his people only to rescue them from suffering because what would probably happen to people who focused on what they were supposed to get? They would probably become more selfish than faithful. And this is precisely what happened in the history of Israel. The mission of God's people is why the book of Exodus emphasizes throughout that Israel was to be a holy priest who bridges the gap between a holy God and sinful people. So if a priest who ought to be a holy bridge isn't holy, then this is what those of us who like to hike in the San Gabriel Mountains know to be a bridge to nowhere. Did you know that there's a bridge up there which is built in the middle of the riverbed? It doesn't go anywhere, and it's now called the bridge to nowhere. The history of Israel shows us that this people usually built bridges for the wrong reasons and in the wrong direction. Toward the sinful nations they were not to imitate. Already in the aftermath of the Exodus, Israel copied the image of a golden calf from the prototypes in Egypt that they had seen, and they worshipped this golden calf, this image, this idol, as the God who brought them out of Egypt, as if it were their God. Again and again, after leaving Egypt and entering the Promised Land, the Israelites followed the gods of the nations instead of the Heavenly Father who had bought them and made them his family. So this leads us to our third text in Hosea, chapter 11, which was written several centuries after Israel arrived in Canaan. The Lord looks back on his relationship with this people, and he says of them in verse 1, When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. But after their father blessed Israel with a gift of Canaan, the children of this precious God, 
repaid his love with disobedience by following foreign gods. And so for this reason, Hosea 11 goes on to say that the children of Israel sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to idols. And by going the way of Canaan, Israel chose cruel and useless gods instead of the good and gracious God who had loved them and brought them out of Egypt. In the following verses of Hosea 11, we see that idolatry is a sin, not just because it is wrong. Certainly it is not less than that. But idolatry is a sin also because it is nothing short of irrational. Why? Well, why would this beloved son rebel against the Lord despite what verses 3 and 4 say that he did? Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them I led them with cords of a man with bonds of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down and fed them. Now this father would be every bit justified to disown this incorrigible son. It's probably what you and I would do if our children treated us this way. But what does he do instead? In verses 8 and 9, we hear echoes of the New Testament's parable of the prodigal son. In the Lord's words to Israel, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim being alternative names for Sodom and Gomorrah, the two wicked cities that the Lord overthrew for their sins. But the Lord cannot and he will not overthrow his wicked people because even as they disobey, he is yearning for them and planning for their return to him after they have been disciplined. There were other prophets after Hosea who would make the same offer to Israel. Turn back or perish. Draw near to the Lord, or he will stop rescuing you from the consequences of your sins. In other words, son, if you really, really want to be with the foreign nations so badly, this is what the Lord says, then to be pagan like them, is precisely what you will have in exile. He gives them exactly what they want. God is wise like that. He is a wise parent like that, who sometimes gives his children precisely what they want in order to show them how foolish they are. You know, there is this term that we use nowadays, the helicopter parent. You heard of that? Thousands of years ago, before the term helicopter parent was ever invented, our Heavenly Father has shown us in His Word that constantly rescuing children from their mistakes can actually be the worst thing a parent can do. And this is precisely what we see in the exile. So after centuries of this back and forth and back and forth, this disobedient son, Israel, finally went into exile in the 6th century B.C., about 2,500 years ago about 500 years before the time of Christ. But even then, the Lord is yearning for his people. He's planning for them to come back to him and to restore their place as a missional family once again. But how will reconciliation between this father, this good father, and his persistently stubborn and sinful son take place? Or we might ask it this way. Who else from this family can be a priest? who will make atonement for the sins of what should have been a priestly people. There is someone else in this family. Not an adopted son like Israel, but an only begotten son who can be sent forth as the perfect one who will succeed where Israel, the lesser son, has failed. And this is the meaning of the temptations that we see in our next passage. The temptations that Jesus faces in Matthew 4. When he is confronted by the devil in the wilderness, the same place where Israel began to fail. And the tempter challenges Jesus and he says, Make these stones become bread, if you are the Son of God. Echoes of Exodus. But the greater son remembers what the lesser son often forgot. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The identity of Jesus is indeed the Son of God, but he will not succumb. He will not give in, like Israel the lesser son did. And when the devil dares him, throw yourself down from the temple roof if you are the Son of God and he'll rescue you, again Jesus triumphs. 
And finally, there comes a climactic test that Israel never faced, gaining the world kingdom if only Jesus would worship the devil. This is a shortcut. The devil says, let me strike a bargain with you. You get to be the king of the world by worshiping me without going through the suffering of the cross. What do you say? But Jesus turns him away with yet another quotation from the book of Deuteronomy. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus has proven himself obedient to his father's plan and shows himself to be a perfect son, unlike Israel, the lesser son. And this is the turning point in history which provides our fourth point about the family. The family as part of God's plan of salvation. Jesus is sent forth as a perfect son who succeeds where Israel, the lesser son, failed. And in fact, it's because all humanity is sinful and has something in common with Israel that we come upon our next text. It's not just Israel, but all people everywhere who are like immature children who should know better but can't seem to grow up. It is because of this that God works out his plan of salvation precisely in the realm of the family. And in our next passage from Galatians 4, the apostle summarizes the entire course of human history, get this, as basically a problem of immaturity. So if you're in Galatians chapter 4, the first three verses of this chapter are where Paul the Apostle describes his audience as being held in bondage under the elemental things of this world. The elemental things. This is an expression that in the Greek language also refers to the alphabet, to those building blocks which you and I call the ABCs. If your child knows the ABCs at one-year-old, genius. If your child knows the ABCs at two years old, pretty smart. If at five years old, the ABCs are all your child knows, then we have an issue. There's an issue of maturity. There's an issue of development. And in the text before us, Paul says, can you imagine people who should have been growing up but are instead learning the alphabet over and over again as adults without ever forming sentences. That's the picture that he gives in Galatians 4 in the first three verses. And this is what happens when people misunderstand themselves to be lowly slaves before a God who is supposedly a cruel master. And there are a good number of us who imagine God to be like this. And such people should have been beloved children who enjoyed a relationship with their father, but actually have demoted themselves to be slaves because they imagine the whole Christian life to be a series of rules, do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts. So if you do the right things in church because you have to, and not because you want to, Springing from a knowledge of God as Father and not as a cruel master. This is what Paul calls a maturity issue. But in Galatians 4, 4 through 7, the Apostle Paul makes one of those U turns that we need to pay special attention to. In verse 4, which is the beginning of our passage, comes the key word, but. But, followed by six phrases that lay out the miracle and the wonder of our redemption as we become part of God's family. And in Galatians 4, 4 through 7, these four verses are probably the most concise summary of the message of the entire Bible. You might think that it's John 3, 16. I'm here to tell you that Galatians 4, 4 through 7 is more comprehensive and it's more complete because of all that it packs into those four verses. So let's look at the six phrases of Galatians 4, 4 through 7, one by one. The first one is Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of the time came, some moments in life are more important than others. We sense that intuitively. And the arrival of Christ came at a moment in which long lay the world in sin and error pining, as the Christmas carol goes. 
For in the disastrous moments after Adam and Eve had sinned, God had promised that one of Eve's descendants would crush the serpent's head with a fatal wound while receiving a non-fatal wound on his heel. So even as sin entered into the world, God promised a solution in the form of the woman's seed. But when would the fullness of the time come? Next came an unbeliever named Abraham, who would be called forth from Mesopotamia, and God would give him the promise to become a father of many nations and a blessing to all peoples. And this is God's promise. But again, when would the fullness of the time come? From Abraham, indeed, an entire nation would come forth. This nation called Israel would dwell in the promised land. But as we've seen, the call to be a blessing to all peoples, it went downhill and became a selfish focus on themselves. So when would the fullness of the time come? And over hundreds of years, Israel would continue to rebel until this nation was no more. When would the fullness of this time come? And over the thousands of the years that the people were waiting, the fullness of time did not come until the first century A.D. A desperate moment when Israel was no longer a nation. Israel had been ruled successively by first the Babylonians, then the Medes, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. So why did God choose this as the fullness of time? Here was a moment in which the continuing disappointment of waiting and waiting and waiting had finally reached its lowest point. The family of God was longing, weary, hungry, and impatient. They were crying out to God, when are you going to show up? Are we still your family or not? The birth of Jesus the Messiah came during a period of time known as the Pax Romana, a time of peace in the Roman Empire. And this same empire had built a vast network of roads, an urban civilization, and finally made official the common language of Greek to communicate among all their peoples. And with these factors in place, which God had marvelously set in motion, the path was ready for the redemptive work of sending his perfect son. So in the fullness of time, the Christmas carol tells us, a thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. Jesus is here. And the next three phrases tell us of the inflection point in human history where our desperate need became God's perfect opportunity. The curse of sin that had dwelled upon humanity from the earliest ancestors to the present day was reversed because as Paul tells us in Galatians 4.4, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Two phrases, short, but densely packed with life-changing truth. And let's just break them down one by one. First, the fact that God sent forth his son means that his son was not created, unlike us. But he pre-existed in order to be sent as the son by God the Father. And that is to say, the baby in the manger, don't think that he was always the baby in the manger. He has been the eternal Son of God who existed from before the beginning of the universe. But even as a divine being who had always existed, the next phrase tells us of the miracle of the Incarnation, the Christmas story that the Creator entered His creation, that this same Son of God was born of a woman so that the eternal Son of God took on human flesh and became a real person like you and me. We think sometimes that Jesus must be like a ghost. He must be like a spirit rather than a real person of flesh and blood who shares our struggles, our frustrations, our weaknesses, and our limitations. But the Apostle Paul, Paul tells us here that Jesus is our older brother who became the firstborn of a new humanity that God is creating. And so how did Jesus triumph when he came into the world as both the Son of God and the Son of Man? And the next two phrases in Galatians 4 tell us that Jesus was born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law. He became a real person to do what? In order to live under obedience to God's law, which had to be perfectly kept in order for a person to receive eternal life and go to heaven. But you and I can't do that. You and I have never done that. We don't have the capacity to do that. 
But Jesus became the first and only son to keep God's law perfectly. And the result of that was that he redeemed all those who were under that same law, but not able to keep it as Jesus did. What this means for you and me is that we are transformed from spiritual orphans into God's adopted children because of an exchange that takes place. Jesus' life becomes ours. Our death, the punishment that we should have borne for ourselves, becomes his. And as if that's not enough, there's a little bit more in Galatians 4. Redemption in Christ is not just about taking us back to square one with God paying for our sins and giving us a clean slate. Because all that would do for you and me is to put us back in the same position that Adam and Eve were in, to slide back into sin again. If all God did was forgive us our sins and put us back at the starting line, it wouldn't be ten steps into the race that we would have sinned again. Right? Who among us, think about it, hasn't promised to God in a moment of recommitment that, God, I'll never, ever sin again. But our immaturity means that we've hardly said amen, and we're already starting to regret our repentance and search for loopholes and look for exceptions to the promises we've made. That's why redemption is much more than avoiding judgment. It is also, as Paul says, that we might receive the adoption as sons. The last phrase of verse 5 tells us about this surprising progression of thought. Redemption on the one side and adoption on the other. You see, redemption is a term for buying slaves. But this has become adoption. A term for becoming a child. Now, how do you get from a slave to a son? When you play the slave price of redemption for someone else, which is what this word redemption means in its context, it's a slave to a slave transaction. Your status has not changed. You have a new master, new job description, but at the end of the day, you're still a slave. But what Paul's talking about here is not a horizontal move. He's talking about a slave to a son transaction. This is a promotion. This is a vertical move that you and I have experienced. Because adoption means that God has given us something much better than a second chance that we would squander anyway. He takes us from the immature disobedience of doing the right thing for rewards rather than for relationship. That was what slavery is. He gives us a new identity as beloved sons and daughters. So before we could ever be brothers and sisters of one another in the church, God took the first step of making us children of the same father and transforming us from slaves, changing us from spiritual orphans into adopted children with Jesus, his perfect son, as our head. We are family with each other. Only because of the family that our Father has first created through Christ, the perfect Son. And having formed this family, Jesus brings in sinful brothers and sisters behind him into this family. So it is essential that we understand that the orientation of God's family at its root is more vertical and horizontal. For if all you and I have is horizontal cohesion, then when we talk of community, we could just be referring to the fact that we have common interests. Like growing up together, wanting our children to grow up together, and providing our families with a safe place to settle down. And when family-oriented churches, which this church is, without noticing, imperceptibly become family-idolizing churches, you know what happens? This is when our vertical community with our Father has taken a back seat to our horizontal community with each other. And when that happens, it's not long before those who don't fit the profile of the nice church family feel like they don't belong. I'm thinking of those 
who've never been married, those who were once married, those who don't feel like they can come and show their face because their children may not be with them in church anymore. These are people who can be made by family idolizing churches to feel like there's something wrong with them because they just don't fit the profile. So when I say that the church is God's family, I'm not really talking about providing a sanctuary for our families, nor even the honorable but not primary goal of providing singles an opportunity to become a family, as if you're somehow subhuman if you're not married. All of these are important, of course, but they're not ultimate. Because if this is the only kind of family that a church provides, then it is perfectly in tune with Asian cultural values in which belonging to a family is all important. But that kind of family has lost touch with God's purposes for being a countercultural family which opens its doors rather than shutting them toward outsiders. Even today, I'll tell you, you can walk through a hundred Chinatowns across the globe if you happen to bump into the Chinese clan association for your ancestral village, or you walk through the doors of the clan association for your particular family name, you will be welcomed like their flesh and blood, even though you've never met those people before. But if you're from the wrong village, or you've got the wrong last name, good luck getting any help from them. That is Chinese culture. But the church as God's family must be different from the cultural or the biological family because none of us are naturally born children of God. All of us were outcasts. All of us were outsiders. None of us deserve to be in community with God. And none of us would be here unless God had first adopted us into his family. And this is what our last passage in Ephesians 1 through 3 is about. These are marvelous chapters. We don't have time to go through them. Otherwise, we'd be here until tomorrow. You have to go to work and school, right? We can't do that. But these chapters in Ephesians 1 through 3 are probably more familiar to us because they deal with big theological topics like the Trinity, predestination, divine election, and the gospel. But if you look more closely, these chapters address those topics for the purpose of expanding God's family to include all peoples. Or in our terms, reconciliation between people in conflict on the horizontal plane is the sign of our vertical reconciliation with God. And that is the gospel. Not just in theory, but in practice. In other words, the degree to which the family of God reflects ethnically, economically, racially, and socially the new kind of humanity that God is calling to himself from all peoples is a direct indicator of how well that family understands what it means to be God's risk-taking family instead of just one another's self-preserving family. You get my drift? Or we could summarize this connection between the vertical family and the horizontal family even more concisely than this, using the last passage we have today. And that's from James 1, 27. And this verse tells us that pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now ask yourself a question, just a generic question. How would you define faithfulness before God? Just a generic, general question. And having asked yourself that, ask one more question. Would your first impulse be to say that God and faithfulness to him looks like esteeming orphans and widows in their distress? Walls down. Go out. Would that be... The first impulse. Or would you be more apt to give the second answer that James mentions here? 
to keep ourselves from being stained by the world. Walls up! Enforce the boundaries. Keep sin out. Think about how easy it is to reverse those priorities, even though God's Word tells us clearly that it's the other way around. This reversal is a sign of how easy it is to forget why God has placed us on earth as his family. And so here, as summarized in our sixth point, you and I are God's adoptees who seek to extend his family to all outsiders, whether spiritual or physical. Here, then, is the missional purpose that God has entrusted to his family— not to be comfortable in this family so that we are mainly concerned about protecting insiders inside and keeping outsiders outside. Because to step outside the comfort zone is precisely what Jesus did in reaching down to us. Allow me to leave you with two pieces of food for thought. Now to some of us, Emphasizing the social essence of the gospel will feel at odds with what has traditionally been taught concerning the spiritual essence of the gospel. And to those of us who may come from this background, I want to leave you with a quote from Carl Henry. He is no liberal. He was one of the foremost defenders of the Bible's authority in a previous generation. And he shows us that social justice is not a partisan issue of politics, as many conservative Christians might be inclined to think, but a biblical one of living faithfully as God's family. As Henry notes, we serve a God who is the God of both justice and justification. The quote is there for you in the insert to your bulletin. Most Christians are inclined to choose either justice or justification, but according to Henry and the Bible, to receive justification into God's family requires that this family extend its borders outward in pursuing justice as well. I know that's kind of abstract, so let me give you a more concrete one. An extended quote from Russell Moore. Uh, he is one of the key leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which is meeting this week in Phoenix. Uh, Moore is speaking. This is where some of our church leaders are this weekend as well. And more writes, after we learn about our gospel identity, we start reflecting the economy and priorities of our new household. You can follow along in the bulletin. The full quote is there. The God of Israel consistently urges his people to care for the orphan, the widow, and the immigrant by noting his adopting purposes as father of the fatherless. He announces, if you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. The Spirit drives us not just to cry Abba in the Christian gospel, but also to respond to the cries of the weak through Christian mission. Orphan care is, by definition, missional. In saying that orphan care is missional, I, that is more, do not mean that every Christian is called to adopt or foster a child but every Christian is called to care for orphans. End of quote. We are the family of God. We were once far away from him, but he has brought us near. May this church family, of which we are members, uh, we feel very much at home in this family, may this church family, and I'm speaking now on family matters, may this church family play its part as God's rescue strategy for lost sinners instead of being a safe cocoon in here to hide from the messiness of the world out there. That's not what we're here for. People out there are dying without God. And they desperately need us to tell them how to join God's family. That is why we are here. It's not just our mission. It is nothing less than our identity. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, what an amazing privilege it is to call you Father. We need you, not least of all because we are weak. On top of our weakness, we so frequently sin against you. And when we bring some of our sinful ways of thinking 
even something as precious as salvation can be something that we save for ourselves and we withhold that gift from others, if it means that our way of life, our comfort zones, and our safe places might be threatened, I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes, first of all, to the orphans that we were but no longer are, that you would remind us that we have been adopted into your family and we really don't deserve to be here. But it was only because of your love, your perseverance and loving us even when we kept on sinning against you, that your perfect son has done what we never could. And as we put our faith in him, you have made us a new people who are gathered not because of cultural values or common interests, but you give us something much better, the privilege of expanding your family. So I pray for this home church of mine, this wonderful place where so many of us have found community and safety and refuge through the years. And I pray, Lord, that you would transform each of us so that this church would in turn be transformed into a place with doors open wide, with walls down, a place where all people feel welcome, where those who are lost will feel like they have found a place to belong, not because primarily or only because of the people here, but because they recognize this as the family of God. This is a place where God is. This is a place where God draws people. And this is a place where people come to know God, not just for knowledge's sake, but to serve him more in the world out there. So Lord, please challenge us. Be gentle with us as we learn these lessons again or for the first time. Help us, Lord, to keep focus on why you have placed us here on earth as your family. We thank you for the privilege of praying to you in the name of your only begotten Son, the perfect one, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.